os decía al principio que no íbamos a hacer cuestiones porque lo que queríamos era hacer pues, como una sesión, un wrap up con, con todas las contributions de todos los, de los ponentes. Eh, y el objetivo de esta sesión era ofreceros herramientas, ofreceros una visión panorámica de todas las cosas que, que, que se pueden hacer eh, con el storytelling, con el transmedia, con el vídeo interactivo. Espero que lo hayamos conseguido. Puntuándonos muy mal si no lo hemos hecho, por favor, nos hacéis un favor contestando a la encuesta que recibiréis por, por mail. No sé si hay alguno tiene ya una, una pregunta que se haya apuntado con carácter urgente o si todos sois muy tímidos y nos apetece preguntar, pero eh, si no hay nadie en la sala que hace una pregunta inmediata, yo directamente me pongo, yo tengo unas cuantas. ¿Cómo lo tenemos esto? Solo un momentito que les traduzco. He's asking about uh, making interactive films. He watched an interactive films, kind of interactive film, and what upcoming projects and, and solutions, technical solutions, are for making interactive films. Pues le doy yo. Eh, esos son, son los pues otros y los buenos, eh. Quiero decir, los que sois medio tecnólogos, medio creativos, esos son los que a nosotros más, más nos gustan porque entienden las dos vertientes y es, siempre es mucho más fácil la comunicación y entendernos, ¿no? De hecho, nuestro director de producto es también muy así y nuestro CTO también. Buscamos mucho, mucho esos perfiles. Yo creo que son, sois los que tenéis la clave de, de, este, de este cambio. Con respecto a lo que se viene haciendo, pues hemos puesto el ejemplo de Netflix. Cuando alguien como Netflix se pone a ello es porque evidentemente pues si el río suena es porque agua, agua lleva. ¿no? <coughs> Hasta donde nosotros hemos hecho a nivel de, de este tipo de experiencias sí que conozco la, la, que, la que comentas, tiene ya, ya tiene su tiempo. Y a nosotros ya nos están llegando también, nos han demandado cosas por el estilo. También una, una conocida eh, marca de, de refrescos, también, que eh, la, la roja, está, sí, <ríe> Coca-Cola. No patrocina, ¿eh? No, 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 no. <ríe> Oye, son, son disruptivos, les, mira, les gusta innovar. Nos demandaron algo en esa, en esa línea. Querían hacer como una especie de concierto, en, no, de película en directo una película como musical en directo en el que la gente desde sus butacas con el móvil pudiera interactuar pues si levantabas y agitabas el móvil pues ibas rellenando una barra de carga y hacías que los, los protagonistas de la película hicieran eh, unas cosas u otras ¿no? o podías cantar en directo también en fin, tipo sin estar eh, y, cosas, y cosas por el estilo efectivamente se están haciendo cosas ¿cuál era el problema? pues el que nosotros antes poníamos en, en valor ¿no? que era la dificultad y el, el coste y los tiempos de desarrollar este tipo de, de experiencias. Sobre todo cuando hablamos de publicidad. La publicidad lo quiere todo barato y mañana. Este es el, el gran problema. ¿no? Entonces eh, teníamos que construir tecnologías que nos permitieran poder producir cosas tecnológicas y creativas rápido y, y barato. Entonces estas herramientas como la nuestra o como otras que hay en el mercado lo que permiten a creativos como tú es la posibilidad de poder trabajar más rápido y sobre todo pues, hacer propuestas o demos mucho más rápido, que es al final lo que va a hacer que, que se desbloquee y que se puedan llevar estas cosas a cabo. ¿no? Efectivamente, las experiencias están diciendo que, que el usuario quiere interactuar, que eso es lo, lo importante. Pero sobre todo interactuar desde, desde los dispositivos, desde en cine realmente nos ha llegado esa, esa propuesta y, y fue hace un par de años. Uh -huh. Adelante. No, que, que se ha hablado mucho de la, del mainstream, de la publicidad, de productos de grandes audiencias... Y, y en cambio quizá queda fuera el cine independiente, el uh -huh. cine más minoritario, documentales que a veces son de grandes audiencias pero a veces no tanto. ¿Dónde, en qué plataformas creéis que pueden tener cabida uh -huh. para rentabilizar ese tipo de producciones, tanto online como, uh -huh. como lo que decías tú eh, en web? O... Esa es uh -huh. la pregunta. Where does uh, independent products fit? in the distribution because model. Because you talk all the time about big mainstream productions to make, make uh, big uh, business, but the, the small production, the independent, more independent cinema, uh, where has it place in, in all these platforms or web? Or <laughs> Anyone in the room? Uh, yeah. I think for independent um, filmmakers, it's actually a nice model to really get to know who your audience are. What I've found when I've worked with independents versus big, big companies, independent filmmakers can move more quickly. Like if you've got a strategy with a big, big plan for a big corporation and you try and turn that around, that's like trying to move a huge ship. It has to turn really, really slowly. And I've found some of the independent filmmakers 
when they listen to their audience and they see perhaps that they're not behaving like they expected, they can turn it round in one or two days. You must have found that with the YouTube um, people, that they really listen back and you can move more quickly because like, you're the boss, right? So you can change your mind and do things differently. So I actually, in terms of independence, think it's a nice model to really get things moving. And with doing that, you have more loyalty from your audience. Some of the YouTube stuff, you know, they could put something out on a Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And what they put on Wednesday, they go, wow, everybody loved that because, I don't know, I wore that hat or I did this or I did that. By Friday, they've changed their plan and there's more of what the audience wants, which is what broadcast can never do. We have to, there's such a long pipeline of development and everything in, involved in big, big projects. But for indies, you can be more agile and move faster. It's my well, spin. With, with, hmm. with more practical example, is that Amazon Direct, for example? Sorry, say that again. No. The platforms, his, with uh, more his practical example. Because que, he que más plataformas, which platforms uh, can an independent creator access to? Distribute its he product. He talked about Amazon Direct, for example, to, okay. to show the works there. Yeah, but I mean, to be honest, all of the social platforms, every year, um, me and a guy in LA, we write an, a Halloween thriller horror story that rolls out in real time over five days, but we seed it for maybe three weeks using social media channels. And from that, we now have situations where it's been picked up by bigger companies because we've put the time in to build it organically on social media channels. So in, t in terms of like tangible <laughs> examples, there's probably loads because I've been working with some indies that are trying to create this. But um, for me, it's knowing where your audience hang out and go to there. So like I said earlier, that the Facebook, Twitter and um, YouTube, for example, aren't always the best places, but really to know where your audience are. De hecho, eh, hace poco, eh, se publicaban las estadísticas de consumo de vídeo en Facebook se salen del gráfico, es decir, las, lo que antes eran redes sociales de conectar a personas se ha convertido en auténticas plataformas de contenido, de no solo Facebook y Twitter, que acaba de anunciar que va a tener televisión en directo. Twitter acaba de anunciar que va a tener televisión en directo. Eh, luego las, todas las plataformas de autodistribución, como por ejemplo VH, eh, VHX, que te permite es una solución para distribuir tus contenidos. Vimeo te permite distribuir tus contenidos. YouTube te permite distribuir tus contenidos. Yo creo que aquí lo que hemos planteado es no solo el, las herramientas, sino también el cómo, ¿no? el, 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 la big idea, es decir, lo que, el, tu punchline. Aquí le planteo a Paco, pero es una pregunta para todos, ¿no te parece que el sector tradicional lo que tiene un poco de miedo es eh, perder el dominio del contenido como creador al, al volverlo más user-centric? I was asking him if uh, maybe creators, traditional creators, are afraid of losing the domain over their content by making the content user-centric. Yes, even I can, I can uh, ¿Cómo quieres, en castellano, en inglés? En inglés, or our colleagues. Uh, yes, uh, um, this kind of changes, in the major changes in the industry are uh, in some point linked to the control. Mm -hmm. So uh, the incumbent industry uh, tries, tries to protect i its business. So, so it's something that, that uh, always happens mm -hmm. when a major change uh, happens in any kind of industry which is, you know, controlling uh, the market, tries to, to hold the control. And the new comers are, you know, a challenge for, for, for this industry. Something that happens in the music industry, uh, happens when, when the bicycle appears, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the people that was, you know, carrying horses, they say, please, uh, uh, bicycles is, is bad for the human kind, you know, so, so these kind of things. And, it, and this is th something that is happening now with the, Entertainment. So new newcomers are challenging the entertainment industry, especially these uh, digital players, which uh, they they are not coming from the entertainment industry. Even Netflix doesn't come from the from the industry True. entertainment industry. They came from the uh, in engineering and technology industry, but they are able to have a lot of money to commission content. Uh, they they are going to spend uh, two twelve thousand millions of dollars uh, uh, this year, 12,000 12, billions of dollars. And Amazon is going to uh, spend 4.5 billions this year to commission content. So it's something that is not in the hands, you know, of HBO or, or, or any other big player. 
So it's challenging the, the, the industry from the technology side. But I, I, besides the, this, there are the, this phenomena from the new creators that are able to, to create a lot of audience from platforms like YouTube. So the thing is to, is, is to think about what is your goal with your documentaries? You want to earn audience? You want relevance? You want to earn money? So depending of, of this uh, answer, you have to think how to distribute the, your content and how to create this content. Think about Vice, Vice Media, for example. Vice, uh, uh, born in the digital side, they create an, an, a spe an specific or you know, their own way to create content. Many of them are documentaries, and now they are selling contents to other channels, HBO, Movistar, uh, BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed has its own movie uh, production company, BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed even doesn't produce video, you know? They produce a, a, a few video. They are more text or, or social content. And now they are producing, producing long forms. So do you agree, Alison? We are in broadcaster and listening mode, not that much into immersive, uh, I mean, in the, the traditional industry, the, tr the traditional players, uh, the distributors, producers, TV channels, broadcasters, are we still broadcasting and li just listening? A little bit, yes. yes. A little bit, I think. Um, it depends as well, like what you said was great in terms of what does success look like? Why are you doing it? I mean, of course, everyone wants to make money, otherwise it's just a hobby. And as great as a hobby as it is, none of us have got time for it just to be a hobby, right? Um, so to use an example of the Dark Detour, the Halloween anthology we do, the first two years we raised in just enough money to get it made, which was less than $10,000 for both of those years, for each of those years. Um, because we wanted to prove the concept or test the concept and see if we could build it and if people wanted it, right? I mean, the traditional channels, even when I was writing books, I didn't really know if anyone wanted to read them. The publishers said they would push it, so that was enough for me. But I didn't really know. We don't really know. And by having that idea of prototyping it for a couple of years, we're now in year three and we're talking to some much bigger names because we've shown our dedication, our commitment, our vision, our willingness to move with our audience and test what they like. So, I mean, that's three years down the line. And it won't be until next year that we actually even get something off the ground. So that's a four-year plan. I mean, of course, it's not my like main day job that I do that. It's been a passion project. But um, I think that the, the slog and the work, you have to prove yourself as well. So many times I meet storytellers and filmmakers who are telling a story just because they want to. And it's in a little way quite self-indulgent. It's great, but it is quite self-indulgent. And I'd like to get to the heart of, in terms of business, what do you want from it at the end? Like your question, perfect. What do you want? Do you want to make money? Do you want to build loyalty? Do you want to test yourself as a storyteller? A lot of these kinds of questions will change the way that you approach to your rollout. Mm -hmm. But like for Dark Detour, like I say, the first two years, even the crowdfund the fact we raised $10,000 on both years was enough for us to go, you know what? We're not going to get paid for this, right? <laughs> um, but people must want it. There are crowdfund campaigns that don't even reach their target at the end of 30 or 60 days. And that is another reason why I believe the indie model is kind of a nice one. Because if you can't raise your money on your crowdfund, then you already know that you're, there's something wrong with your idea, in my opinion, anyway. Mm -hmm. Any more questions, más preguntas? So I'm going to this corner right here, mm -hmm. the ones that are dealing with broadcasters, uh, clients, and whatever. So it's easy to convince someone when you have a story with a great punch, like, of course, Game of Thrones. But what happens when you have like a, a very small and independent project, your battle, your struggle? So what about the experiences? Um, what, what do you learn when talking and pitching your ideas with the, with the clients? Are they very clear about what, what are they pursuing, about their objectives, about what they want, about how to measure the, the, the results of, of a transmedia experience? Or do you think they say, no, I want to do transmedia because it's, it's trending right now. We, want, we have to make transmedia because everyone is making transmedia. So what are your experiences? For transmedia, I'm going to let <laughs> you speak. <laughs> okay, so I start? Okay. Oh, Good. So, 
Well, I think that my experience is like different in each case and each project that we've been uh, doing. It, it really depends who, who you're talking to, but I think that we've been lucky enough that we always deal with innovators or disruptors. Uh, or even if they are from big organizations, <laughs> there's always someone there that yeah. wants to the Illuminati. Illuminati, exactly. <laughs> that want to do things differently. And they are the ones just trying to change things from the inside. And those breaches, I think, that they're the opportunities that we have to do something. Um, obviously, they have to sell it in and people on top are always going to want like <laughs> something tangible, mm -hmm. like um, KPIs or something. Uh, but normally, if you have like that person inside that they trust mm -hmm. and they, they trust their gut instinct, they normally allow them to maybe just give them a room, like little room to experiment. Mm -hmm. um, because normally they, they don't invest a lot of money in, like, yeah, this is the future. This is, uh, we're going to put a lot of money in transmedia experiences. But there there's room to do things. And, and I think that in the case of Game of Thrones, like Bernie was like really seeing where uh, we should Bernie be was your kind of your showrunner yeah. or whatever yes yeah he was like he was like the project leader from the, from inside and he was like so he was like a clear mind of what we should be doing and and the, we need to offer something for the user so in that specific case we never had the idea of like no the goal is we have to get lots of new subscribers for canal plus <laughs> um which like a major broadcaster might have thought like yeah if we're going to put this money it's because we want to get more subscribers but th that was not the case like they all had from the very beginning of the project a very clear idea of that no what we want to do is to keep on building our brand so we equate like canal plus to hbo content so it's we really keep on uh, building on quality and we offer our already existing fans, already existing users, those who are following the social media on Game of Thrones and their fans, something they can that is memorable, that they can remember, that they can relate to. But we are not going to be uh, really uh, taking into account how many of them are going to pay for something in the end. Um, this is not always the case. And I think that's why maybe transmedia experiences are like causing this, um, mm, I don't know, lack of excitement uh, in the in the bigger corporations or broadcasters is because they don't see like the return on investment is straight away. But they don't really, I think the model obviously has changed and some of them don't see it, but we are going towards a model in which loyalty must be like the, the go-to um, success uh, indicator mm -hmm. uh, because you want, I mean, in this, jungle of content you want people to, to stick by you mm -hmm. i mean it's the youtubers example is perfect you it's mm -hmm. like this kind of fans uh, that you want so it's not the same that when you work with a broadcaster or with an indie creator but i think that um, everyone eventually would realize that we cannot keep on measuring things the way we used to mm -hmm. that's a good point as for me if i well understood your question and we're not mainstream. Uh, I think the web platforms are more made for indie people, small companies, uh, with projects you you wouldn't put maybe on a on a theater in a cinema. Um, I don't get to know what uh, broadcasters want, but I know now what is their editorial line. So it's easier for me to say, okay, this won't go, this won't fit with Arte Creative, for example, uh, or this would fit to Studio Cat or to Black Pills and so on. Uh, I know they have a frame of, uh, of kind of, not stories, but of uh, number of characters, the kind of, uh, the potentiality of the story that they have. And at the beginning, like eight years ago, I think we were working a lot before showing them uh, anything. And now I much more spare our time and the time of the creative people we, work with, we are working with, uh, meaning that um, I don't develop anything before we have a very strong pitch. Once we have that, we can develop um, like a small treatment. And if I have that, I can put some images, some everything for the, for the client, the broadcaster or anyone to figure out how uh, we want to tell this story. 
So, and with this, it's not too, too much a big work for us. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's not like two months of writing. And two months of writing, we need to get paid for this. So you need to hook the client or the, the, the broadcaster before uh, really developing your ID. Mm -hmm. But then, and last point, uh, for those uh, web projects, you don't need to write a lot to show people how uh, it might be. So if it needs to, if you show it to a broadcaster and say, yeah, but how is it like? Could you show me a bit of writing? Writing one episode is not too long. So you know the, the habits of showing them projects and being, seeing projects rejected and so on. You, mm -hmm. You're starting to guess what they want and what they like. Mm -hmm. And you, you can guess also what, what are the strong pitches. Mm -hmm. um, a mí me gustaría, todo dentro de esta idea de, de, de un poco de aterrizar todo lo que hemos que se ha dicho, se, se, hemos, tenemos un montón de información de todas las presentaciones que entre todos pudiésemos eh, confeccionar pues como un manual de, de, de recomendaciones o para lo, los que nos hayan metido de lleno en todo el tema del storytelling. So, if we could just maybe craft a, like a handbook of strategies and, and, and a piece of advice for creators in your respective areas. So, Paco, si tú tuvieses desde tu perspectiva de, de youtubers, creadores, ¿qué, ¿qué crees que esto puede aportarle a un creador tradicional? ¿Qué puede importar? ¿Qué estrategias puede importar de las lecciones del boom de, de YouTube? Well, um, I think that uh, anyway, the, the, the important thing again, and we are going to be, agree. You know, we are going to agree, is the story. Story has to be good. If the story doesn't tell nothing, it's not going to, you know, to engage. Nobody, even for a YouTuber, it's the same. The thing is that the YouTubers create content from the, you know, from credibility. It's their life. So it's what they are showing to their audience is what they are living. So, so uh, for the audience that is in the same culture and in the same age, more or less, it's something that is a mirror. They are watching themselves on the, on the life of the YouTuber. Uh, so, so, Uh, this kind of uh, relevance coming from the authority of being, you know, uh, the master of your life, let's say, is something that is going to be always, uh, it's going to work always, because it's uh, mm. a, a pure storytelling. But besides that, YouTubers are creating other kind of contents, even documentaries. For example, Luzu, Luzu, uh, is, uh, the, the, uh, his, his videos, are almost documentaries. It's their own travels from the, you know, uh, traveling across the USA or in the north, in the Cantabric Sea and in the uh, count Basque Country where he's born. And it's like a documentary that tells his life uh, traveling. So uh, it's a YouTuber telling their, his own life, but, but from the point of view of the truth. Let's say the truth, you know. It's a good point. <laughs> And again, I'm going to say story. We probably all are going to say story, right? So let's assume we're all going to say story. And we get that bit done. And money. <laughs> And money <laughs> um, so for me, it would be um, building it around that core theme, that heartbeat um, of emotion. And to figure out perhaps what you want your audience to do But if it's not anything that's interactive, then perhaps how you'd like them to feel when they finish watching your movie or your TV show or whatever. Um, so I think if you can bring that emotion in and you have a sense of how you want them to feel, that will help craft the story. And then always to know who your audience are, which was when I went from writing books to writing plays. For me, everything changed. That's when I actually could see my audience um, behind the red curtain And I was looking out and there was a part that I'd written that I thought was really funny and nobody laughed. So I was glad I was behind the curtain. Um, there was another part I knew was a little bit sad, but I didn't think it was that sad. And I could see people in the audience wiping their face with a tear. And I was like, oh my God. And um, that sense of knowing who you're telling the story to and how you want them to feel at the end of it. For me, they're two big factors. La verdad que coincidimos. El punto de vista del, del espectador es, es importantísimo y el que la historia sea capaz de conectar emocionalmente 
con él es, es lo básico. En nuestro caso, lo comentábamos antes, eh, por mucha interactividad que apliquemos al vídeo, eh, si la historia realmente no conecta con el usuario eh, y realmente no hay un número de visualizaciones interesante, pues eh, por mucha tasa de engagement, si han entrado 100 a ver el vídeo, pues al final la, todo el esfuerzo que se vuelca en una producción de las que de las que hemos visto no tiene no tiene retorno entonces que el, el elemento eh, impacto emoción historia conecte con la audiencia y viralice es es importantísimo y, y la interactividad en nuestro caso el software que aplica a la capa de vídeo interactivo es un es una commodity al final no es esa es tecnología que en realidad es, es algo que puede tener cualquiera, ¿no? Lo, lo importante es la parte creadora. Sí, lo has dicho, lo has dicho antes, simplemente por subrayar lo que, lo que dice Raquel. Eh, yo creo que la mayor responsabilidad que tenemos los tecnólogos para ayudar a los storytellers es eh, poner o intentar poner la medida posible la tecnología en las manos de los creativos, un poco más. I very much agree with you, and uh, I think that when you and you and you too. You do when your story is good, you can drag them into very sophisticated transmedia scheme, <laughs> and you can put them to do things and a lot of things. But I wanted to correct myself because I said I want to spare the time of the creative people I'm working with, um, because uh, I'm not asking them to think for one day or two uh, to their story. Sometimes it can take you a lot of time to have a strong pitch and uh, be aware of when you send your story, if it's not properly done, you can still have someone telling you how you should work, or uh, I would say corrections and so on. But if you send it too quickly, then you might have, um, how to say that, answer saying, no, I'm not sure about anything. Uh, I don't know, but it will, uh, your story will be weak. Whereas you could have waited for one month more, not a month of work, but a month of sleeping, of seeing other things and reinforcing your story. And then when you pitch it, then it's strong. What I mean is that uh, when you send it to, whether it's a broadcaster or a producer or anyone, at the third lecture of your story, you're bored because you, you've already uh, read, uh, read it. So you know what it is about. And even the small changes, even if they are important, you won't notice them in the end. So work well on your core idea. So, and then you do transmedia sophisticated stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so transmedia is not a requirement, <laughs> not necessarily. Um, but I agree with all what they've said, obviously. Um, uh, but if I had to insist on something, I would say, um, like try to be user centric, uh, try to m make sure what the, u the user wants, who your audience is. And even um, if, if you get the chance to like drop some ideas to them early, uh, to do some rapid prototyping, uh, to make sure how the interactions or mechanics or dynamics would work with the audience that you're trying to tell the story to uh, with like focus groups or whatever, I think that's pretty, pretty useful because we're not uh, gods of storytelling and then we have everything in our heads and it's going to work for sure because we've, you've devoted lots of hours to do it. Actually, the more input that you get <coughs> from other creators or from uh, the target audience, the better uh, because if you do it sooner, it's going to be easier to do the fixes than when you have released it um, and then it, everything is like mm, forever there. So I think that is also a way to start building community early on. So you don't really have to wait for everything to be finished and polished and perfect. I think I, think I would remove that idea of waiting for something to be perfect um, I, because I think that you have to get some feedback on how what it will be. I mean, it's not, uh, I'm not just contradicting you, um, but it's, um, again, um, <laughs> I think that for obviously for the pitch it has to be perfect, but I think that for getting the pitch perfect, you need to make sure that the story is right and you have to get it out of your head uh, sooner rather than later, I think. Okay, so. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to add something because you're talking about user-centric and you're talking about uh, knowing your audiences. 
but uh, I've been talking lately with authors, and when you create a fiction, I think that in the beginning, you should forget who you're talking to. You should forget the audience, the public. It seems weird, I don't know, to, I know to say this, but you should focus on the story you want to tell because it has to be very personal, very authentic, tell the truth. And at the beginning, if you imagine people, you, watching me telling a story, this would be terrific. So you need a bit of protection in the beginning to try something and to try to tell a story without thinking of who your audience is. It's a question that will come very soon enough uh, to think about it, but in the beginning, a bit of protection is also necessary, I think. Don't sit down and like write a prescription yeah. and say, right, this is for that age group and it's going to be this and this and then try and make a story. You have to have the idea of the story yeah. first. <laughs> Don't try and lay out those all of those variable things and then write a story for that. Like, that would be mm -hmm. hell to do that. You're right, you have to have that story first that you know where it's going to go. Mm. Totally agree. It would like be filling a form when you're trying to tell the story, yeah, so yeah, it wouldn't right. work. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yes, uh, no, th there is another element that, that maybe is very basic, <coughs> but it's very important. All of, all of this is about time and attention. You know, so time is the, the exchange going, uh, always has been, but now it's more important than ever. Because the young generations does, doesn't have, you know, a, a, a lot of room to things that they are not interested in. You know, if, if a video is not watched in YouTube in the first 10, ten seconds, the algorithm take your video and destroy it, you know, <laughs> to the bottom of the... Because uh, YouTube uh, works under the idea of the watch time, time that you are devoting to each video. So to, to attract the attention is key. But at the same time, convinced today in, in our day where the content is everywhere and you don't need, let's say, you don't need to go to a cinema to watch the content, convince the people to, you know, <coughs> to go walking or by metro to a cinema to watch a, a movie. So they, they have to be uh, convinced about that the experience is going to be uh, worth. Uh, and, and in that sense, transmedia is important. Because transmedia is a kind of a strategy that is telling yes. me something about the story <laughs> that is able to convince me, to convince the, you know, the audience to, well, I'm, go I'm going to pay the ticket for the cinema and I'm going to go to, you know, to wherever to watch a, a, a movie. So, uh, a quick recap. We have good content, we have relevance, we have pure storytelling, quoting your words. We need story, bring it to life, giving it emotions, uh, knowing who, who are you telling the story to, work on a strong story, whatever it takes, working on the core idea, not thinking about your audience, be user-centric, but also think in time and attention because the attention span of millennials and digital natives, we can agree, it's, it's, uh, it's closing a little bit more every day. So, uh, and transmedia. Yeah, transmedia. too, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so uh, you opened the door. Uh, we have big data, we have algorithms, and we are uh, entering the uh, zone of tailor-made productions. And of course, Netflix is the elephant in the room in making designed uh, products for their audiences. So uh, I was reading, I think, like a month ago that Netflix has identified one hundred and no, one uh, thirteen uh, thousand um, thirteen hundred communities of interest. They don't uh, um, <coughs> they don't uh, see their clients like demographics, but archetypes and tastes. They like comedies. They like this actor or whatever. So let's talk about tailor-made product, tailor-made fictions, tailor-made uh, in their audience because the the. the is it a democracy? Is it good for filming, for filmmaking and TV making? Be so uh, user-centric, uh, uh, yeah, and thinking about the audience. Do we make that way more uh, connected products with the audience, or are we just blowing up the whole industry? What do you think? Boom. My theory on that, I think, this is what I think, I think social media taught us how to be in communities again. I think like when my parents were young and first married, they knew everyone on the street. When I was a kid growing up, I knew everyone who lived on my street, right? 
Now, we, but then we got to a point where we didn't know anyone who lived on our street. And I'm not a very good neighbour. Like, I don't really like talking to my neighbours. I'm like, hi, hi, and I run in the front door. But the people I know on social media are gathered together by common factors. Places we've met, things we've liked, experiences we've shared, conferences we've been to together. So I think social media taught us how to be in communities again. So we live in, I live in an age where I don't really know my neighbourhood very well. And that's kind of good, I don't mind that. But I've got friends all over the world. And then I have these different friends that we would talk about different things together. And I think that where we are with kind of storytelling has pushed that a little bit further. And I think the fact that the broadcast model, I believe, is dead and we have these little hubs, we have Channel Flip and we have YouTube and then we have the bigger names of Amazon Studios and Hulu and Netflix and all of those. I think that it's, it's taken that behaviour one step further. So I personally believe that the stories that are built in the smaller communities that are tailor-made, if you like, are the ones that have the potential to gather following and to gather interest and then it's like planting a seed that you water and you water and then it starts to grow and grow and grow. Because part of the big problem in all of this um, is discoverability. How do you get your work found? So you could then you know, have big, big ideas and you put a lot of money into something and there's so much noise out there that it's not even noticed or seen. So to tailor make something for a smaller community that you build and grow together with you then have the opportunity, hopefully, that they tell their friends, you make them part of it somehow, so they then want to share it. You know, it could even be this author was asking for my advice on medieval torture, right? And um, it, you, they gain interest through word of mouth, through those communities. And I think that a lot of the big shows that we've seen, apart from the huge ones that are commissioned by big, big names like J.J. Abrams and stuff like that, have possibly grown in smaller communities and they've been watered and watered until somebody's seen them and they've been taken to something bigger. So I am a big fan, of course, of the big, big game and the big money and all of that. But I also do believe that planting the seed and watering it is, and tailor making stuff, you have a quicker opportunity to gain recognition for your work and to get your work seen. And then you build on that reputation. That's been my experience anyway. Anyone more from the team A? <laughs> team A? <laughs> no, team A? <laughs> Who what team, team A is okay. okay. It's okay with tailor made uh, fiction and product. Um, I, I so much agree with you. I mean, I, that was uh, reminding me of a project I was involved with. Uh, it, it was uh, this web series that was called uh, Spaniards in London when I used to live there. And in there, I just participated as an actress. And um, it was this crazy web series made of uh, completely stereotypical Spanish characters that land in London um, with music, and it was crazy. Uh, and I thought, well, this is fun. We are just having a fun time just doing this. Um, but then it went massive. I mean, it was a success. Uh, we make it to the news. Uh, it, it, it was a, a big fan base uh, there. And it was like, how come? And it, it happened because like, there were lots of Spaniards going to London with the recession and they f needed to feel as a community. Uh, and that was so important because uh, I actually was, I've been working in London and two or three times someone stopped me and said, you are the one from Sirius. Oh, that, I, I love that scene in the interview because I've been there and, and I felt like so um, related to that and, and I felt that it was amazing. And I thought it was like such a niche product, uh, but it was so successful that it really tells you how important like community art and like how if you tell a story that is so relevant to you, you're going to talk about it, to share it. And it's like such an important factor that we should be taking that into account as creators. I think it's the, the, the you know, the long tail uh, we were talking about before. I was talking about before and those niche things. I don't think you you can really tailor made um, a, a fiction uh, for people because imagining how they would receive it is guaranteeing you to go in the wall. But then you have to tailor made the way they can receive it. 
So be on the different social medias and uh, being where they are and not contradict their habits. For example, uh, Jezebel, you've seen, they've been, we had three broadcasters, which was quite exceptional for us. We had Switzerland, uh, Belgium, and France. France, they launched everything at once. So you could binge watch it. Binge watch it for one hour is a bit stupid, but yeah, you could binge watch it, the, the, the 11 episodes in a row. Uh, RTBF did one episode, one episode per week. And RTS did something in between like everything for one weekend and then one per week. And the Switzerland, I, I, was, I was thinking that RTBF was quite right at the beginning, but in the end, France was right. Because people, they like it, they want to they wanna go to the end. Because they switch so quickly that they won't remember our little series one week after. So once you've hit them, you need them to, to consume everything. So I, I think this tailor-made is more for the habits of people than mm -hmm. for the, the, real, the real thing you want to tell. And I think it's more personal. Hey, yo tengo una pregunta. Habéis eh, estado hablando de la importancia de las historias y de que el contenido sea central. ¿Qué pasa si el contenido es bueno y no conseguimos llegar? Eh, o sea, ¿es, ¿es solo el contenido suficiente? It's uh, content enough. What happens when the content is good, but you just don't reach your audience? In, in, in our days, uh, it's not only the content, you know, because when you distribute in a digital world, it's the discoverability of the content, as Alison said. So you have to make everything in your hands to make your content dis disco discoverable. And, and well, what, what makes a content good content? Because it's another question, you know, maybe, maybe you know, uh, The Walking Dead, for example, for many people, is something horrible. You know, and it, and it was a stories, zombies stories was neat 10,000, 10, uh, you know, back, and now it's mainstream. So what happened in the middle? You know, maybe it's the context. Now these stories are going to work because uh, thanks to technology, thanks to internet, these, these stories are, are arriving to more people. So it's uh, something that, we, we must think about it, you know, how, how the content is reaching the people to be uh, successful in terms of audience, because if you are in terms of, you know, uh, awards in festivals, maybe it's a different thing, you know, I, I know a lot of good content that is a lot of awards in festivals, but no many people is watching it, mm -hmm. and even it's not uh, arriving to the, to the cinemas. Yes, sometimes it's just dead. Honestly, like you've, you've uh, aired your content, you haven't reached your audience, you did everything you could. You don't have the money for a big bonuses, transmedia, or promotion Interactive plan. video, I'm whatever. Not assimilating mm -hmm. everything, you know, of course. Transmedia <laughs> rocks. <laughs> but you don't, you don't have the, the, the money for all of this, and it's been aired, and it's over. And then what would you do? It's like a feature film, it's not the proper week, it's been in summer. You don't have you don't have any choice, and you can't you can't know if there's another Star Wars coming. So it's just dead. And sorry. So next kind of. But then you can have awards because it's a little uh, fewer people, juries that are gonna watch your 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 work. So they can give you awards. But as for the audience, at some point, mm -hmm. just yeah. As a creator, you, you need to be aware that you cannot be successful in terms of, of reaching your audience all the time. But maybe you can do it right and the or right, right way, yeah, or <laughs> great way, a great content and a great story. And even though you, for you something reach. that you can explain, yes. you cannot explain it, uh, then you learn. For sure, it's going uh, to have. You need to be prepared uh, no. to that. No, it, I mean. for sure, it's going to be the consequences of, of, of something. Maybe it's the you know the season. Uh, that you are competing with, but but now in in our world we have more information than ever. We 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 are able to to study to analyze the data, as as Netflix does. You know, Netflix is building contents on the top of the data. You yeah, know? but so, I think in Netflix is a big corporation, and but you, they you can have do it. To, uh, but as a as a small creators, it's it's difficult to do that. No, no to the, analyze all the data. You have to you think like like resources. Sorry, you have to think like big companies because you don't have the money that Netflix has but you have the creativity the same creativity or more than the, than the big companies 
and in your hands is to study what is happening in the in the social networks. Something that you can, you know, investigate and to and to know more about the kind of audience that you want to reach. And maybe you are not able to use the API that is a payment API from the Facebook or Twitter, but you uh, are, are able, and believe me, this is something that is possible to do, you are able to investigate the audience uh, through social networks and to, you know, to reach to, to, to conclusions about if your content is going to work or not. You, you, you can do that even being a small creator. But again, as Rafael says, uh, we have to learn about technology and how technology uh, is, is going to be used by creators. We have to uh, speak more with the ten technical people and to learn more about technology because our world is, you know, uh, full of technology. There's a uh, there's a strong content wars right now, and the the online is uh, is based on a pattern of, of relevance. So I think that's a, a very a quite interesting question: it's how we make the content relevant, not only for the audience but al also for the system. How do we make our videos viewable in Instagram and viewable in our newsfeed and viewable in YouTube? And how we make the content relevant so it goes up in the in the YouTube playlist. So some tips for making your video, maybe tagging correctly, maybe reaching your communities. What comes up to your mind? Well, before that, before I, that, you I have just a story. Feel your question, <laughs> sorry, your question about is content enough? I actually don't think that it is if it's the just the core part of your film. Like if you've gone to the trouble of getting the scripts and the crew and the set and everything to shoot that, I think that you'd be crazy to not tag half a day even onto that to shoot some additional content. Some of the early testing in transmedia, I mean, they went to the expense of a second unit on set. So they actually were shooting additional footage, tiny little backstories, tiny little threads that came away from the main characters. Um, even that, that would be done with the actors out of character, giving some of their stories of how they came to be involved in the shoot. Some of it was in character stuff. I just think it's about smart thinking. And if you've gone to the trouble to build out everything so you're at a point where you're shooting it, you'd be crazy to not get that extra value out. Create a series of short one-minute pieces, even 30-second pieces, even still images that you can use to help with the discoverability and allowing your work to be found. Because, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the average time to consume straight content, a film is maybe 90 minutes or two hours. A book we could maybe read in three or four days. A library would maybe give you a book for three weeks. A TV series, anything from 15 minutes to one hour. Where the time is spent is on social media and playing computer or console games. That's where the hours are. So if we can create experiences or little offshoots or mini series around our 90 minute or two hour movie, then why wouldn't we do that? So content isn't enough if the content is just the film, but if the content has all these experiential fun things around it, it serves in a way of helping it being found and helping you build a community around it too. So that's one thing I always do say, which is why I talk about the theme and the experience that you want to build, because I've, I've written very many different things and I know how much work goes into that. And then to just tell it in one way, I think it's just like crazy. That you've, even if you don't use that extra footage at that time, you've got it in your back pocket ready for when you might need it. And the more you update your website, the more you update your name, your title with fresh content, the more you go up into the Google search, the more you make your content uh, searchable and, and findable for your audience. So it's quite of a thing. We only think about your movie, uh, maybe a teaser and a trailer, and that's just not enough to make your movie visible. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's transmedia and all the content that is surrounding transmedia helps the content with more, more reachable, more accessible, more, more visible. I think it's definitely uh, the war of visibility. Yeah. The content is there, but you can reach it. Yeah. Maybe interact like interactive video. Interactive video is making more visibility for the content. And as for internet, I should advise you to put naked women in your thumbs. Yeah. Yes. Honestly.
I don't I know the word in French, not in English, but it's like you want shocking images. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, this is <laughs> working. I, I, I sorry, sorry, maybe I'm speaking a lot. Uh, I learned a lot from YouTubers and from the tools that they are using. Uh, for example, the, you 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 have to read the creator's playbook from YouTube. Is that all the samples and how is the process to uh, get uh, well positioned uh, in the uh, within the platform? And there are a lot of tips about how how you can make that your content. Uh, get discover discoverable. YouTubers are obsessed with the audience. They are watching their statistics continuously in their mobiles. And as soon as they uh, detect, you know, uh, that that the uh, uh, views are getting down, as as they know what happens when your audience, your views are getting down, that your video is going to be to the bottom, they uh, edit the video, uh, you know, uh, on the air. They edit the video too. Uh, cut pieces of the video that are not being watched. So uh, and they are creating, you know, very, very agile how the video uh, has to be to be more discoverable. That's a good tip. Sí, muy rápido. Uh, referente a YouTube, uh, lo que, bueno, no soy experta ni nada, eh, pero lo que me Yo he tampoco, dicho, eh. <laughs> bueno, <laughs> Seguro que más. Uh, lo que me he dado cuenta es que esta primera generación de YouTubers de la que has hablado antes, son youtubers que prácticamente empezaron con YouTube, ¿no? que hace cinco o seis años que están uh, en la plataforma. Y como lo que he visto es que como más grandes se hacen, más marcas van con ellos, obviamente. Y eso lo que hace también es que sus suscriptores de, de, de sus inicios pierdan como esta realidad, esta verdad de la que, de la que estábamos hablando. ¿no? Y yo lo que me pregunto es si hay un momento en que como youtuber, como más grande te haces... A más verdad pierdes y por lo tanto igual hay un momento en, le, en el que pierdes tus suscriptores o puede, no, no ha pasado, ¿eh? pero pueden llegar como a la obsolescencia esta de decir es que ya sí, no hay sí. verdad en lo que estoy contando porque me he hecho tan grande y esto es tan mi trabajo que tengo que sobrevivir con algo que ya no me dará lo que me sí, da. Sí, ¿no? No, no, estaba muy bien apuntado porque de hecho pasa. O sea, hay un, eh, llega un momento que hay un cansancio y que ellos mismos pierden esa verdad, sobre todo los que empezaron hace, hace tantos años. Pero claro, la audiencia es muy lista, lo nota, y como tú dices, deja de ver los vídeos. Probablemente no se desuscriban, pero no ven los vídeos. Y cuando tú tienes muchos suscriptores y pocas views, ¿sabes lo que hace el algoritmo con tu vídeo? Al pofón. Entonces, mejor tener engagement a tope, gente que ve tus vídeos, etc. Pero es cierto que ese es el gran reto de los youtubers. Ese cansancio, tanto de su audiencia como de su creatividad. Y de repente ya no suenas, como tú bien dices, ya no sueno verdadero, ya no es mi vida, es la de un personaje. Eh, Paco, de hecho, YouTube ha elevado el requerimiento de views, no para servir publicidad, si eh, no tienes un umbral de views, 100, no, no te sirve en publicidad. 150.000 creo que es ahora, eh, para, para poder participar en campañas. Esto se hace también por, por el tema de que se quiere llegar a un punto de brand safety, que antes comentábamos, entonces se, se piensa que si has sido capaz de llegar a 150.000 views, no solo es que tu contenido está enganchando a audiencia, sino que además YouTube te ha dejado vivir, ¿no? Entonces eso quiere decir que no estás poniendo cosas muy locas, ¿no? O muy contrarias al civismo, etcétera, ¿no? Es el, ¿Qué pasará con los youtubers de aquí al futuro, con esto que comentas de ya no es real? Pues está por ver. Es que como en el vídeo de Casey en estas que veíamos antes, nadie sabe realmente a dónde lleva esto. Nadie lo sabe, es simplemente vamos a seguir hasta ver hasta dónde nos lleva, ¿no? Ya lo veremos. Si se agotan creativamente, si, si nos parece todo mentira, que de algunos a mí me lo parece. ¿eh? Yo ya, ya veo quiénes son personajes y quiénes no, ¿no? y quiénes siguen siendo más auténticos. ¿Tenemos alguna preguntita más? ¿No? Aprovechar. Uh, I had a question. Yes. For, for Playfilm. Ah, for Playfilm. <laughs> <laughs> um, because when we're trying to sell uh, things to broadcasters and it doesn't work with only the script, the paper, we're trying to do pilots. And if I want to try an interactive pilot, can I use your solution for free for a while? In Spanish, because my English is like the mono of the photo. For ser tú, sí. <risa> no, en serio eh, sí que hay una opción eh, tienes eh, 30 días gratis 
para probar Playfilm con full funciones, o sea, puedes hacer todo lo que, lo, que, lo que quieras, puedes probarlo, puedes testearlo, hasta un mes, 30, 30 días para, para hacer wow. el piloto, presentárselo a, a quien quieras y, y luego ya si te decides, pues tienes unos planes de precios maravillosos, <ríe> muy asequibles y muy asumibles. <ríe> pues... Eh... Después de toda la sesión, yo creo que la lección es, bueno, adiós a la zona de confort, ¿no? La, la tecnología ha llegado, eso ya es, no es un elefante en la habitación, ya está encima de nosotros, hay que aprovechar todas las oportunidades que tenemos para salir un poco del modelo tradicional de explotación que nos han enseñado. Yo creo que hoy todos hemos aprendido a que se pueden contar historias de muchísimas maneras, que se puede llegar a eh, ser un producto de éxito con una audiencia muy... muy eh, muy pequeña y que incluso aunque sea una historia de, de fracaso desde el punto de vista tradicional, puede ser algo que te ayude a generar productos que en el futuro estén más conectados con el público y que tengan un recorrido mayor, un very long tail ¿no? del, que hablaba, del que hablaba Eric. Muchísimas gracias, de verdad que ha sido un lujo todo. Habéis preguntado poco, pero no pasa nada, no os lo voy a tener en cuenta. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much for your yes. presentations, for your keynotes, for your kindness, uh, for being so open up, so generous. De verdad, muchísimas gracias. Yo creo que hemos tenido un panel de verdad de lujo y los tenéis, tenéis sus contactos en el programa y seguro que cualquiera os podrá contestar a las preguntas que tengáis ahora o si sois tímidos, pues por escrito, en virtual. Muchas gracias y gracias por haber venido a las Jornadas Profesionales del Día y os esperamos el año que viene. Gracias. Gracias.